So, hello everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Andre. I'm a bioinformatician at IPT, and today I'm here to talk about our research on codec. And our codec is called. Okay. Just a second. Better? Thank you. So, I'm a bioinformatician at IPT, and today I'm here to talk about our research on codec. Our codec, codec is called Pantheon Codec, and let's start. So, IPT is a public research institute with more than 100 years of history, providing technical solutions for industry, governments, and society, enabling them to overcome the challenges of our time. So um, our research initiative is in partnership with Lenovo Brazil, and the initiative is called Prometheus. So as many of you, many of you already know, uh, we need to talk about a little bit about what is a codec before entering how we handle the DNA data storage. So sorry for repeating this. So what is a codec? A codec is a device or a software that transforming one type of data into another. In the case of DNA data storage, it transforms binary data into the basis of DNA in a process called encoding. The reverse operation, transforming basis of DNA into binary data, is called decoding. In between, we have three steps. DNA synthesis, which actually producing the real DNA molecules. Storage is the step to keep the, the molecules safe for retrieving them later. And DNA sequencing, which is retrieving the information inside the DNA molecules to decoding it. So our main goal with our Pantheon codec is to have a flexible codec, having a robust DNA architecture uh, that supports uh, recent uh, DNA data storage um, new standards and also include processing algorithms that are compatible with the massive data that came from sequencing platforms and also different strategies from sequencing and storage. And why is Pantheon Codec? Uh, we developed different algorithms that act on different sites on the workflow for DNA data storage and we named them according to the, their features into ancient Greek gods or titans. So up to now we have six different tools, Apollo, Artemis, Chiron, Hermes, and Hephaestus, and Gaia. Here we have a condensed view of the DNA data storage workflow. We have two pillars here, DNA synthesis and DNA sequencing. Everything we have between these two pillars are molecular steps, also known as wet labs. And adjacent to these pillars, we have processing data on inside the computers. So from left to right here, we have Apollo, that is responsible for encoding. Here we have Gaia. Gaia is our simulation tool capable of simulating synthesis and sequencing. And for pre-processing the massive data that came from DNA sequencing platforms, we have Chiron, Herms, and Hephaestus. And in the right side, we have Artemis responsible for decoding. So let's start with encoding and Apollo. Uh, here is an illustration of Apollo, the god of sun, poetry, and music. Here is a painting of Apollo playing one of his songs. So let's do a parallel between creating a good song and storing the information inside the DNA. Uh, to make a good song, we cannot simply expect to write down all the we want to sing in a piece of paper and create a good song. The same works for DNA data storage. We need to do this in an organized way. We need to rhyme, uh, fit the melody, fit the, the rhyming and everything. This is also true even for living beings. They need to organize the genetic material into their own genomes, in genes and also pack them in chromosomes. So how Apollo really uh, encoded DNA? The smallest unit for Apollo, it's a short DNA sequence, also known as oligonucleotide or just oligo, 
We can think of this as a small package we use in telecommunications. It has a payload and also a short part that carries the readiness for error correction, correction codes to work, and also a header that informs which chunk of data we are handling. Here, we call this part as address. And also, this, uh, this package is flanked by two primers. Primers are important in, red, in a wet lab for amplifying and tag uh, DNA sequencing. So how Apollo process the, the binary data to uh, put all the information inside the payload? It receives the bit strings that came from the system, analyze and process it, slice it into chunks of binary data, and then encode it to fill the payload. Here is the same. Uh, you need to rhyme here. Not all DNA patterns fits well on the payload. Some homopolymers and other types of repetition prones this, the, the oligo to errors and also form herpins impairing the amplification. And you can act in two points to prevent this, here in the mapping and also here in analyzing and processing. And we just submitted an IP to patent about a method to preventing binary patterns from zeros and ones to become a DNA patterns, regardless the file type. So after Apollo create many oligos, he packaged these oligos in a block. We can think of these blocks as a uh, disk, hard disk block. You set the size of this block when you format the disk. And here, you set how many oligos you are going to have inside this block when you start the archiving. At the same moment Apollo is filling all the blocks, he starts to organize the metadata from file system and also from the blocks and the codec parameters inside the JSON files. After all blocks are completed, he package all the metadata and create a special block. We call this archive metadata block, A and B. And then he fills the blocks with new oligos carrying the more redundant information. We call this alter code. Alter code is important to retrieve oligos that are damaged or missing after the sequencing. So how we tag and look at this information in the molecular helm? We use a combination of primers. Here we can see uh, we use overlapped designed primers. The external one is universal, so we can tag and apply the whole archive. And the internal one is block specific, so we can amplify each block individually. So how information and files are stored inside the blocks? It depends on the file size and the number of uh, the number in the file, the file size and the number of files you have. Some blocks, you can have multiple files inside and a single big file can be spread across multiple blocks. It's like a Tetris game. You need to minimize the free space lived inside each block and also minimize the number of files spread across multiple blocks. And here inside our metadata, we have the sequence a system directory tree, the file checksum to make sure we are retrieving the files correctly. We also have the files coordinate within blocks, the codec parameters we need to decode these blocks, and also the primer data. We can also include some optionally uh, information to help and assist the retrieve, uh, recovering process, such as the codec manual and also some wet lab protocols. And to decode, we need to follow some order. First, we read and decode the metadata block and then go into the real data blocks. To separate these and organize these for decoding, we rely on a process called demultiplexing. I'm going to return to this later. So the integration with the new standards for DNA data storage follows the same uh, logical. First, you access the information on sector one and sector zero that carries the basic information that needs to start reading our archive and then jump to our archive. After that, you will start decoding the data blocks. 
So here, let's start about processing the files after the sequencing. As it was mentioned before today, we are not handling with a single copy of the oligo. We are handling a population of copies, uh, identical or nearly identical in cases we have errors. So the sequencing platform cannot spot the difference between them before sequencing. Everything was read at once. And then we have three different gods that handle this massive uh, data. Chiron, Hermes, and Hephaestus. So the first one that receives is Chiron. These three gods can work in a different ways to achieve the, the objective. The first one is Chiron. Chiron in Greek mythology was a centaur and worked as a tutor and a teacher for many Greek heroes like Achilles and Hercules. Here, he's a tutor for newborn sequence reads that came from the sequencing platforms. I separate a few features that Chiron has, such as adapter trimming, the multiplexing, merging, read pairs, in case we are using pair end strategy, re reorient DNA uh, sequence, in case it came from the reverse complemented, and also discard low quality reads and contaminants. I'm going to talk about more about adapter trimming and the multiplexing. So, depending on the strategy you use, you may include other sequencing in your oligo that helps in the molecular steps. You need to trim this after your sequencing. This normalizes the read length. And Chiron can identify this region and remove them. The second step is the multiplexing. For this, let's use a different analogy. Uh, let's think about the blocks that uh, Apollo created as a planet book. Everything is ordered, each oligo is a different page. But what we got from the sequencing platform is like a huge pile of papers. All books are mixture, all, all pages are in a random order, and pages have different numbers of copies. And Chiron takes the block-specific primers to organize each book in a different pile. This process is called in bioinformatics as the multiplexing. Okay, so now we have a huge pile of each individual book, each individual block, but up to now, we don't know if uh, an oligo is missing and we have a population of copies. We don't know each one is the best one for decoding, if we need to do multiple sequence alignment and consensus or not. And to solve this, we create an uh, address-oriented algorithm. We call this HERMS. HERMS in the Greek mythology is the message of the gods. So for HERMS to work, we need two things. The first one is a address library. And we recommend this address library to be built using deep distance to avoid errors to convert one address into another and also avoid homopolymers and other types of repetitions, such as microsatellites, because these type of repetitions prone the sequence to error. Address look, uh, works as a barcode that identify oligos inside the block. So here we have a representation of the top sequences of the block, and here we force the, ma uh, the mapping to be reaching A and G, so we can easily spot where the outer, uh, the inner code is. And inner code is the second thing that Herms need, an inner code visible from a DNA point of view. So Herms can look at this without the coding and do a parity check and know if the read has error or not. So here on the left side, we have a tree that can we can check uh, decision tree, how ARMS works, and send the read to three different destinations. One is Hartem's box for decoding. The second one is for multiple sequencing alignment and consensus, it means holding from, his, from himself for the second step. And the third one is for Hephaestus, for using a different clustering method. And here, we have an address checklist. We have three different categories for address. Close, it means Herms find a flawless read for that address. And fill it, 
it means that Harms only find uh, sequences that have errors for it or open, mean we have missing oligos for that particular address. So let's take the field address as an example for the next step. So taking the pile of address true, Harms take this pile of reads, perform a multiple sequence alignments and a consensus. Also do a parity check. If everything is okay, send to our Artemis. If we find an error, he going back, take the whole pile and send it to Hephaestus. So the multiple sequence alignment is very good to fix errors, including substitutions and also deletions and insertion, which these two are very tricky to sort using the classical error correction codes. So the second algorithm we have to cluster and get the consensus is Hephaestus. Here, we have to look at the whole sequence. And this algorithm is very heavy for computers to calculate and relies on several repetitive steps. And because of this, we name it as Hephaestus. Hephaestus is the blacksmith of gods. And this work of repetitive steps and sometimes needing to use the brute force, it's similar to a work, worksmith work that craft metal to, to build something. So this is the basic steps that her, uh, Festus use to cluster and make a consensus. The first one is to compare the sequence pairwisely and then cluster each sequence, each group of sequence according to their simila similarity and then build a consensus from a multiple sequence alignment. We can save some time using cluster uh, Kamer strategy to avoid aligning uh, sequences that are not similar. And at this point, we are going to show that the multiplexing speed up clustering a lot. So this strategy here was adapted from the metagenomic studies and other Amplicon studies. So here, uh, instead of having a single step of camera processing, pairwise alignment, clustering, and consensus, we noticed that using three different similarity thresholds, grouping more similar sequences first, and then slowly add more divergent sequences works better than having a single one. So here we have a picture of how Ephesus is working inside his forge. So the last, the last god from the left is Artemis. Artemis is the twin sister of Apollo. So everything Apollo does, she do the reverse operation. Apollo do the, the code, encoding, she do the decoding. Artemis is, uh, she is the goddess of uh, nature, haunting, and the wildness. So up to here, we expect the most errors was already sorted by Hephaestus and Hermes. She just need to run down the remaining ones. And how she does that? So first, let's see how she decodes the metadata. She took the oligos from the, our metadata block and also add the information carried by sector one to start the decoding. She used the inner code here, not only to spot errors, but now fixing it. And then we have an oligo without error. She decoded it back to binary. And then using the outer code, she can recover missing uh, oligos or damaged one. And then she take all chunks of data, binary data, to reconstruct the file. In this case, the our metadata file. So, Having the metadata file in hand, she takes now the data blocks. Oligo by oligo, using the information of the metadata, she now decoding the blocks of data and now recre recreating the file tree, the directory tree, and now all the files and check it if everything was decoded correctly. So the last god we are going to talk here, actually it's not a god, it's a titan, is Gaia. Gaia is uh, the personification of nature. And for us, he gave life for our creativity. With Gaia, we can simulate different scenarios and strategy to speed up our codec development. With Gaia, we can simulate different strategies like per-end and single-end, 
library preparation, simulate different cover on the sequencing, and also simulate different sequencing platforms. She can also work simulating different synthesis bias. We, we have a set of mathematical models for, this, for the synthesis. I can see two models inside the Pandora's box we have. One of them is Medusa. Medusa simulates what happens if you fail to clean up everything after you finish the sequencing, the synthesis process. So we, you end up having uh, se uh, sequencing with long lengths and also sequences with short lengths. And the second one is Manticore. Manticore simulates what happens if you skip the capping process in the classical chemical synthesis. So for one side, you speed up the process. From the other side, you increase the deletion rate. And using Gaia, we can figure out what happens in the downstream analysis. So after we have all the gods in place, we can now talk about the exercise we had for end to end. We use this exercise to test the library, others library we build for HERMS, and also test the HERMS for the first time using real data. So we uh, encoded 1.6 megabit from three different PDFs using Apollo. It creates about 70,000 oligos in, separated into 15 blocks and one special block, the metadata, we synthesis and then sequencing using Illumina, parity the end strategy using MySeq, and then processing it using Chiron, Herms, and Hephaestus, and then decoding using Hartems. All, all files were retrieving one, with 100% accuracy. And now we do several runs of sequencing to check the missing oligos, the reproducibility of missing oligos. Each run separately, we have 0.09 about of missing oligos. Combining all runs, we end up having 0.03 missing oligos. So this shows that outer code is vital because even combining all runs, we end up having 22 missing oligos here. Uh, even having like 68% uh, 68 times coverage. We start calling this the pitch of tartars of, for DNA data storage. So you can run several times and you are going to still have some missing oligos. This happens not only for DNA data storage, but also happens when you sequence in large genomes. For example, the human genome was only 100% coverage April last year. So why this happen? Why we have the pitch of tartarus? There are several reasons for that. One is unwanted patterns on the oligos, which I talked on Apollo. And we need to avoid this because it impairs amplification and increase the, the chance of missing oligos. And another thing that may cause this is just the sampling bias. So we can imagine like a, a huge swimming pool full of marbles. And what is the chance that we take just a sample of this swimming pool and go to all the different types of the marble? It's just probability. And we can repeat this many times and we are and always getting some missing oligos at the process. So let's check the performance of the Kodak using this end-to-end -end, uh, experiment. So Apollo takes 31 seconds to encode the metadata and the data blocks. Chiron takes one minute and a half to spot the metadata reads inside the sequencing reads. Hephaestus, receiving the reads from Chiron, took one second, almost two seconds, to process and clustering alone all the metadata reads. Herms, he's a speeder. He, he used far less than one second to process he, him alone all the metadata reads. And Artemis takes about eight, a little bit less than eight seconds to decode the, the metadata. Here we are talking about 9.3 million reads using a single CPU core. So let's talk about the data blocks. 
the time of Apollo doesn't change because he already did his job. And here for Chiron, for the multiplexing, he spent 15 minutes, almost uh, 16, to do the demultiplexing for all the blocks. And we also implemented a fasted mode that took about one minute to finish, but we need to keep in mind that this will increase the missing oligo rate. And here we can see a huge difference in time between uh, using the demultiplex and without using the demultiplex for Hephaestus. Hephaestus took about one minute to finish all the 15 blocks using the demultiplex, and without using the demultiplex, he takes more than nine hours to finish the same job. Herms, he, uh, in this case, he also a speeder. He takes less than one second, half a second, to finish the, his job. And here, Artemis takes 21 seconds to decode all the data blocks. Here is the same, a single CPU core. So with all the gloves in place, we can now sh see that our codex works not only on the simulated environment, but also with real data. And with new technology and new algorithms, we, can, we have more space to keep developing and keep improving our algorithms we have for assist DNA data storage. So thank you very much. Please, if you have any question, I'll be happy to answer. Yes, sure. Yes. Uh, we implemented more than, than one type of code. In this particular case, is read solvable. Yes. Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, just repeating the question, we are doing all the steps included, not only the ICC. Yes, sure. Not yet. Any more questions? Well, yeah, sure. Well, uh, if there's any error bias regarding the metadata comparing to the data block, is this the question? Well, it's something we discuss a lot, and in our code, we can choose to encode our data or metadata with a different encoding scheme compared to the, our data block. So it might have, depending if we use a different encode scheme. But in this case, we use the same. So data blocks and metadata is the same encoding. Thank you very much.